You've learned how to look closely and deeply at artworks. You've built a vocabulary to help you identify, describe, and appreciate formal elements, such as this artist's compositional choices to place a vertical lamppost in the center, dividing the space in half, and emphasizing the deep space that plunges back to show the light shining off distant cobblestones. Formal analysis helps you to grasp the how of the artwork, how the artist laid out figures in space, how the artist orchestrated color relations so the light violet gray of the umbrellas contrasts with the warm yellow of sky and cobblestones. But those skills will not explain what the artwork represents. For that, you need information about historical context. Someone viewing Caillabaud's painting in 1877 in Paris would have recognized this neighborhood as ground zero for gentrification. Where there used to be narrow streets with working class apartments, the French government had demolished the old buildings and constructed wide boulevards and grand apartments for the wealthy classes. Only six years earlier, the working class people of Paris had revolted against the government. They pulled up the cobblestones from the streets to barricade themselves and battle the army. They established a workers' government, the Paris Commune, that controlled Paris for a few months until the French government crushed them. The new wide boulevards were designed to make it easier to control rebellious crowds. A viewer who saw Caillabaud's painting in 1877 would have noted the silence and isolation of his figures as a contrast to the communal struggle and violence of 1871. The meaning of an artwork can only be understood in relation to its historical context. That is why historical inquiry is the next important skill you need for art history. And the remainder of the textbook introductory chapter goes over those skills. It discusses the process of identifying subject matter and decoding symbolism. In doing so, the textbook introduces you to the terms iconography and iconology, which were coined by one of the great art historians of all time, Erwin Panofsky a brilliant man who had to flee Nazi Germany for the United States. Living as an immigrant, Panofsky realized that we are all immigrants to an unknown culture when we study art from the past. Panofsky made a distinction between conventional symbols and what we, he called natural subject matter. Natural subject matter is anything we can identify in an artwork just by being human. In these two paintings, we know that we're looking at human beings because we all are familiar with human bodies, and we know that smaller humans are children. Panofsky would say that almost nothing else in this painting can be confidently called natural subject matter. To identify anything else, you need knowledge of cultural conventions. For instance, in the painting on the left, why is that little child wearing a Tarzan costume? Is it Halloween and he will use the bowl strapped to his belt for candy? Read the textbook to find out. One of Panofsky's great insights is that almost all symbols are conventional, not natural. If we were an alien from another planet who had observed human beings, we might know that children are little and adults are big. We might guess at a parent-offspring relationship here, but we wouldn't necessarily know that long dresses and hair means these are women and mothers. Gender is signaled by cultural conventions. Speaking of aliens, Spock is an alien on Star Trek. We know he's a Vulcan because of his pointed ears, impressively diagonal eyebrows, and square bang hairstyle, all of which are his symbolic attributes, the visual symbols that identify him. By decoding them, we are analyzing the iconography of this Star Trek film still. We recognize the Statue of Liberty from her symbolic attributes, her upraised arm holding the torch, her crown of sun rays, her toga, the writing held in her hand. 
Together, these distinguish her as a figure with a specific identity and meaning, expressing the themes of political liberty and progress. But Panofsky went further. While iconography involves identifying symbols, iconology expands on the meaning of those symbols by placing the entire artwork into its specific historical world. Iconology involves finding out why specific symbols were felt to be powerful in a specific time and place. We know that Lady Liberty holds a torch to light the path to freedom. If we pay attention to the fact that she was made by a French sculptor in the 1870s, we see that he has used the same arm position that symbolized working class revolt, but his sculpture stands calmly and triumphantly to commemorate the abolition of slavery and the Union victory in the Civil War. Knowing this, we can see that Bartoli, the sculptor, is responding to the political struggles of his time when the most oppressed groups of people were fighting for political representation and justice. The mighty quality of his colossal figure in the context of the times makes her a 19th century version of the Roman goddess Libertas associated with emancipated slaves.